Good afternoon and welcome to the 11th episode of CNET Development Dialogue. We have with us Sheena Mangalya to discuss the role of technology in advancing women's rights in Africa. Sheena works in the Women's Rights Program at the Association of Progressive Communication in Kenya. And she's also the coordinator of Take Back the Tech Project and has over 12 years of working and living experience in Namibia, South Africa and Kenya. Thank you so much for joining us today, Sheena. Thanks for having me, Shruti. Thank you. So to begin with, um, when we talk about women's digital rights, uh, we know that the technology ownership among women is still quite low in emerging economies like India and Africa. Um, for instance, women in India are about 50% less likely to use mobile internet in comparison to men. So how important do you think it is for women to have equal access to the internet and digital services, especially during the pandemic? Um, it's, it's extremely important. Equal access to the internet is important, um, always, even outside a pandemic, um, especially when experiencing a reality that limits movement and access to basic needs such as health, safety, education, and food, and for all women in all countries in Africa. Um, the internet and other digital technologies allow women to access information um, and resources um, that have a direct impact on improving our lives. Um, case in point, for example, in Kenya, when the government um, instituted a dusk till dawn curfew, um, I think it was around June or July, um, and this was brutally enforced by Ovazila's police who severely limited people's movements for many months. This blanket directive had a direct impact on women accessing sexual reproductive health uh, services. Um, a particular example is how women who went into labor, pregnant women went into labor in the middle of the night, were not allowed to go to the hospital. They were not allowed to be seen moving around uh, between, I think it was at the time, it was between uh, 9 p.m. and 4 a.m. And this mm -hmm. led to a crisis because a lot of women found themselves in situations where they went into obstructed labor. A lot of women had lots of... Um, like severe gynecological issues that were not attended to. Um, an obstetrician um, in Kenya um, found this out uh, called Jemima uh, Kariuki. And she put a call out online and said, there's a crisis going on right now. Women cannot access, access uh, pregnant women in particular, cannot access the right kind of assistance, maternal health assistance that they need. And then what this did is that it, um, it shed light on the issue, right? Because the government just decided it's going we don't move without taking into consideration how this has a direct impact on women's health and life. So in this case, we see how technology was used to build solidarity, raise awareness at a time when people really needed to know what was going on um, on the ground. So technology is very important for women. Yeah. Uh, all right. So uh, when you talk about, it's interesting that you spoke about women's reproductive rights and how technology has uh, definitely helped women uh, access and communicate better. Um, related to that, do you think the internet is changing or disrupting the existing discourse on women's social, political and economic rights, especially in Africa? So I think um, that it's a misnomer to say that the internet is changing the existing discourse on women's various rights in Africa because the internet cannot change without our contribution. So what this means is that we are already shifting how we think we've been uh, pushing, we've been challenging um, the status quo and what we're doing is we're bringing these narratives online so these narratives online would not exist if African women and LGBTIQA people and other people on the margins were not bringing these narratives online. So we are shifting the discourses of how African women are seen online, but we're not necessarily saying that um, it's the internet that's changing us. We are the ones that are changing the internet and how it sees us as um, African women, because we have been disruptors uh, for, for the longest time. Um, and this is, a, a, um, I guess, a misconception of who African women are. Um, and some of it lies in our colonial histories and how women were seen and how women were studied um, in relation to our environments and our cultures and um, the effect of religion on our lives. Um, 
So what is happening now is we are pushing back, but we're bringing this narrative to the online space. The online space isn't changing us. We are changing the online space and how we are seen in it. Right, right. But do you think internet or social media has kind of given it an impact of some kind or has it remained the same? Has the movements remained the same in Africa or has social media kind of um, helped uh, increase the you know uh, communication and the impact in Africa? Social media has definitely um, taught us a new way to strategize. It has taught us a new way to to show solidarity. It has taught us it has, it has revealed to us a new front line um, where we can defend our rights. I know for sure that a lot of feminists in particular and a lot of um, women's rights activists are constantly having to show up every day and defend an idea that is seen to interrupt the status quo. The difference that the internet has made now with movements and social media in particular is that they now can exist across borders. Um, and a Kenyan problem is no longer just a Kenyan problem. Um, we've seen situations where I know in particular in, in APC, where I work in the women's rights program, where we've had activists who have interacted in different spaces, both online and offline, showing each other solidarity. Um, when we have um, a comrade or somebody that uh, we've worked with and whose work we appreciate and admire in India that's coming under attack and they speak out and they say, you know, this is what's happening. Um, we, as you know, Africans or people in the global south or even from wherever in the world, we all come together to defend each other and to, to push back and to reclaim back the safe space that uh, we want online. So the internet and social media has definitely had like a, a big role to play in moving our, our understanding of issues uh, shifting the context away from uh, country-based or just geography towards a more wider understanding of the impact of you know, patriarchy and um, capitalism and um, colonialism on the lives of uh, people in the global south. Right. So um, while we can say that technology is kind of improving cross-border solidarity, uh, we also see that access to technology is divided even amongst um, only a certain, certain class of women. The narrative only from certain class of women is kind of put forward. Do you think that's the case? Um, yes, yes and yes and no, because I think um, it's important to talk about the internet, but to also talk about technology. I think sometimes um, the internet is positioned as this, 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 um, this solve all for everything, yeah, um, for everyone everywhere. It is an important tool, but I think location matters. Where you live, how you live, what your immediate needs are really matter. Yes, the narratives of um, women, rural women online, are not um, are not are not properly represented, right? But this does not mean that we rural women don't have access to technology in ways that benefit their lives. And sometimes those are the stories that go missing, because a lot of the times uh, women in um, urban areas are responding to emergent or immediate needs depending on where the con what the context is and what the issues are that they are responding to in that particular space. But women in urban areas do need to um, pay more attention to how the online discourses and beyond just the discourses and the narratives, the impact that our online activism has um, does have a ripple effect across rural, urban, online, offline, that these, in, these interventions do travel beyond. So there needs to be a greater awareness of issues beyond just our own uh, context and our own reality. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, um, you know, as internet is becoming part of our daily lives, uh, on the flip side, we also see that online misogyny and gender-based violence is increasing and becoming more prominent online. So uh, what do you think needs to be done to kind of address this issue and how can we ensure uh, safe spaces for women online? Um, so the, some of the work that the Women's Rights Program has done at APC and in the different projects we've done is revealing to us through research, through um, 
trying to really understand the impact of the internet on our lives, we're realizing that um, the online offline online offline binary is a false it's a false division. Um, what happens online does have for our lives. Women are embodied online. Women are seen um, in particular ways online, but these two realities mirror each other. Whatever violence is happening offline, it's happening online. Um, the idea that because I'm being cyber harassed, I can just turn off my laptop and go away, it's, it's not true. Um, the, the, the attacks that women experience online have real and lasting um, implications for our mental health, our physical health, our well-being, our ability to be in the world and to be online. And to be online is to be in the world. Um, what needs to happen, um, it's many things. It's already happening. Uh, it's, it's initiatives that um, identify what discourses perpetuate violence online. Who is saying what? Why are they saying these things? But also finding them at the root cause. What's happening offline? Who is online? Who has space? Who has power? Who has voice? Who gets to push a particular agenda online? How do we build more solidarity? How do we push back? How do we create content online that counters narratives that are that are driving the, the misogyny narrative? It's multiple approaches. A lot of them lie in everyday people coming online and wanting to learn how to be better both online and, on, and offline. There's also policy uh, work that needs to go into making sure that um, the violence that women um, and LGBTI people experience online is seen as as part of the reality and the continuum of violence that we experience, right? That if somebody insults me in the streets and somebody insults me online, an insult is an insult, it is an attack on myself and my personhood, I do not feel safe. There should be consequences for people who um, deliberately go after and seek to make other people feel unsafe online. So it's, very, it's multiple approaches that need to be um, applied in response to this. Right. So uh, I think one very important point that you brought out was that uh, offline lives and online lives are not mutually exclusive. They kind of mirror each other and cannot be separated from each other. Um, so this is the last question from me to you, uh, is that what can India learn from Kenya's experience of providing equal digital access for women? Um, I think there's a lot to be learned. Um, but a lot of it isn't new. Um, when something that I did want to say earlier is when we're talking about equal access, we also have to talk about meaningful access. Um, our, both our governments, I think, still have a lot to do in terms of ensuring that um, the internet and technology is not something that's still so deeply classed where um, and monetized in a way that only people with uh, more money can get the good internet, right? Um, and people without enough money can't get good enough, strong enough, good devices. So uh, capitalism is shaping our access to technology and the internet in a way that disenfranchises people who are already disenfranchised. Um, so this is something that needs to be recognized as a need. Um, access to technology and the internet is no longer a luxury. It's no longer this nice thing you have because you have a smartphone or because you have you know, 5G um, speed internet. It is something that changes how we experience the world that we live in. It changes how we see ourselves. It changes um, our ability to respond to various realities. It helps us feel more grounded. The internet is a necessity and both I think our governments need to, to see it as such. Um, and I think something that Kenya might be getting right is, is the, the movements that are showing up online. And I think India as well, a lot of the movements that are showing up online are testament to the power of the internet to push, to really push back um, against um, the state against um, uh, patriarchy, against uh, capitalism, right? So those from the different movements emerging online on various daily issues in both countries, I think there's a lot to be learned um, between our two uh, countries. Yeah, so um, through our discussion, I think I realized that there's a lot in common between Kenya and India and that we can learn lots from each other. 
Um, and another thing that you pointed out was that uh, internet and technology is no more a luxury. It has become a necessity. So we need to look at it as a public good. And that is why equal access uh, of technology is very important for women and LGBTQ community. Um, so this has been an extremely insightful conversation, Sheena. Uh, again, I'd like to thank you for joining us today. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me so much, Shruti. Thank you. Thank you.